It's time for Agriculture, presented by Tricana Farms in Germantown, New York, a small-scale producer of heritage breed livestock and a wide array of vegetables and berries on just over 39 acres. They also produce a full array of garden vegetables, many of them heirloom varieties raised naturally, as well as an assortment of berries, including raspberries, blackberries, gooseberries, black, red, and white currants, mulberries, and elderberries. And now, here's Mark Scherzer. It didn't take long yesterday after I closed the north door and locked the sheep in for the barn to get a warm, cozy feeling. This is not generally the feeling you strive for in a barn on the eve of Memorial Day weekend. But with temperatures in the 40s and a cold, steady, pelting rain, it was most welcome, I think for the sheep as well as for me. Lately, I've added to my evening chore routine, trimming the hooves of one or two sheep per day. It has to happen every few months, and I could see recently, as some of their hooves began to resemble those Ottoman slippers with the upturned toes, the design of which I'm certain was inspired by overgrown sheep hooves, that the time had come. Sometimes it can be exhausting to do just one you. I have to catch her and move her against her will toward the chair contraption with a seat made of a net sling that I used to immobilize them in. I'd estimate the typical adult ewe is 80 or 90 pounds live weight, strong and resistant. I have to turn her around and get her to back into the chair and tip her up so that she ends up in the net sling on her back with feet in the air. On a hot day with sweat running down into my my eyes and unable to let go of my chosen victim for a moment, that part is work enough. Once in the chair, the sheep are sufficiently impatient with being in such an unaccustomed position that they writhe and try to escape. In doing so, they risk injury by getting their legs caught in the wrong way in the netting or behind the bars of the chair. Unhappy at the unusual sensation of a device working at their feet, they may kick at me or otherwise injure me or themselves by making those sharp trimming shears slip in some way. To keep them still, I need to keep the full weight of my body against them as I work, because if the pressure lets up for an instant, they sense an opportunity to escape. As I move in response to their writhings, we may end up in limbs intertwined in contorted postures, all akimbo. To keep them calm as I work, I whisper soothing nothings to them. Good girl, you're doing great. Almost there. When I succeed at asserting my authority, they let, they let me know by nibbling at my ears or clothing. At the end, we're both exhausted. To the extent the These images evoke sexual themes in your mind. Calm those kinky thoughts. If you want a clear vision of how this process goes, go in a more comedic direction. The mechanical challenges of hoof trimming I've I've just described obviously preclude my taking any selfies during the procedure to illustrate my description. But if you want to visualize the process, check out the classic 1932 W.C. Field short movie, The Dentist, in which one of Field Hilds' patience, played by Elise Cavana, writhes in and out of the dental chair as he extracts a tooth. That episode dominates the third quarter of the film, but I suggest you treat yourself to the entire masterpiece available on YouTube. It's only 22 minutes long. Cocooned in the barn during the early evening yesterday, warmed by the heat given off by the gathered herd, working on the second you, I achieved a kind of nirvana. She stopped writhing as she nibbled on my sleeve. Her hooves trimmed easily. It was satisfying to extract trapped clods of dirt from under her overgrown hooves and from the space between her toes. I found myself wondering why I found such peace in a moment of intimate domination of a creature of another species. Why, I wondered, should this activity seem to me something worthwhile to do? My shrink has discouraged this kind of questioning, which he sees as as undermining my life choices. Why ask what makes it valid to want to do something, he asks. Why not just to admit to myself that this is something I enjoy doing and want to find a way to make part of my life going forward. Why does it have to mean anything at all? Sorry, doctor, I can't help it. As I worked, it occurred to me that at least part of what made me find this activity worthwhile is that I perceive the management of the natural world and of other species as something I achieve by force of my will and my muscle all on my own. That individual effort with a tangible resulting achievement makes it meaningful to me. Seeing through, seeing fulfillment through that victory can be viewed as a symptom of living in the modern world. Jill Lepore, 
writing in the May 24th, 2021 New Yorker, summarizes the view of philosopher Byung Chul Han that we live in an achievement society, one which Lepore characterizes as a yes we can world in which nothing is impossible, a world that requires people to strive to the point of self-destruction. The effort to achieve goals which are often be beyond our individual capacity results in some cases in what is termed burnout. But in another way, the fantasy of management through will and wit of an out of control greater world reflects age old human instincts. I just started reading Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons from Modern Resilience by Georgetown University philosopher Nancy Sherman. Stoicism is in vogue these days, but one of Dr. Sherman's major points it is that our modern view of stoicism as espousing indomitable will that can and should battle whatever the conditions and systemic structures, however adverse, is a caricature. Stoicism was really not about just about the individual's will and strength and resilience, but also about mutual support and collective action. Unfortunately, some of the most well-known stoic philosophers like Epictetus strongly emphasized that theme of individual resilience as invis invincibility uh, to the exclusion of other aspects of the philosophy. And that aspect of the philosophy runs deep in our culture. My notion, or perhaps more accurately fantasy, that my sense of worth derives from working all on my own to tame nature, to feed myself, represents that caricatured strain of stoicism Dr. Sherman critiques. Perhaps I've avoided burnout by accepting that I can only do what I can do and will never fully master the farm, nor actually fully feed myself from it, making all of this more clearly the playing out of a fantasy. But oh, what a powerful fantasy it is, and how satisfying when I believe I've fulfilled it. I haven't finished the book yet. I will report back on whether Dr. Sherman's insights succeed at reorienting my approach to this farm. But I suspect that value systems ingrained since birth are, after this many years, not easily adjusted. Agriculture is underwritten by Chicana Farms, LLC, a small-scale producer of heritage-bred livestock and a wide array of vegetables and berries on just over 39 acres in Germantown, New York. More information, 518-537-3815.